and 20, when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, I think some of you may have heard me say this before. But I talked about when I was a kid growing up and we were taught the five W's and the H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And one of the things that I have found that is helpful to me is to take those five W's and that H and apply it to every aspect of God's word. Who? God. What? Love mankind so much. When? Before the foundation of the world. Where? On Golgotha. Why? Because man is a sinner in need of a savior. How? By sending his only begotten son. And you can look throughout the Bible and you can apply that every place and it's going to come up with the same thing. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son because the father knew that man could not redeem himself. He knew that there was something that he had to do. He had to have a plan of salvation for mankind. Can you turn with me to Ephesians 2? Starting with verse 1, it says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversations in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for allowing us to be in your house one more time, to be in your presence, Lord. Father, we don't take these things for granted. And we ask, Lord, that you give us an ear to hear what you would have to say unto us. Lord, I just ask that you use the speaker this morning to expound on your word, Lord. God, touch the hearts of your people so that they might be good ground as your word is sown. And Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory in your holy name. Amen. And ye, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. And I want to take for a thought this morning, dead yet alive. When we look at our life as man, 
We were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We had no other recourse but to die. The scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And here Paul is letting us know that it's God who quickens man. Although we may have been dead in trespasses and sin, God yet quickens us. And he, he quickens us with the same spirit that he raised Jesus from the dead. And it gets even better because as he quickens us and he makes us alive in this mortal realm, that same spirit is going to quicken us and take us to be with Jesus forever. When you think about the fact that we were born in sin, and here the scripture tells us that it doesn't matter that we were dead in trespasses and sin. God has a plan of salvation for mankind. There is only one plan. There is no other way to get around it. He is the only one who can take us from death into life. He is the only one who can give us life. You know, when we look back in Genesis and we know that when God created Adam, he breathed in him the breath of life. And that one breath is what has sustained mankind from the beginning up to now throughout when Jesus comes back and gets us. But this is a different life that I'm talking about. Jesus told his disciples, he said, I come that you might have life and that you might have that life more abundantly. And when we look at how God has blessed our life, we think we're living down here. I can remember before I got saved, and I was getting ready to turn 26. And I didn't know that I was actually praying, but I was telling God, I have a good life right now. I'm living it. Young, got a tough car, got nice clothes, had plenty of money. This is the life not realizing that I was just a walking dead man. You know, when we look at life in the perspective of this realm, we think by having a fine car, a fine house, fine clothes, money in the bank, we think that's living. But that's not living. It's possibly buying us a highway into hell. But when we look at surrendering ourselves to God, accepting the plan of salvation that he has for us, that's when we truly begin to live. Jesus. And what's good about this life that he gives us, it isn't for just right now. But this is the life that's going to take us throughout all eternity. We don't have to have a break in living. We don't have to have a break in having the true life that God has wanted for us. But we can go from having life in this world to having life throughout eternity. And it says that it's God who quickens us. You look at that and you think about God's attitude towards mankind. And this is just me, it's not scriptural. But if I had created somebody and gave them a paradise to live in. And came down and walked with them in the cool of the day. And they decided that that just wasn't enough. They wanted more. They wanted something different. I don't know that I could be as loving and merciful as our father. Now, I know some of y'all looking at me like, yeah, I would. No, you wouldn't. It's not our nature. But God, in his love, in his mercy, he looked down past our sin and our trespasses. And even though we should be awarded death because of our sin, he's willing to give us life. 
We don't have to live a dead life and then go on to live a dead life in eternity. And when you look at that death, because of our sin, because of our trespasses, that death is a separation from God. That means that we don't have that communion with him. That means that we can't go to the Father when we want to go to the Father. You know, the scripture says, come boldly to the throne of grace, whereby we might be able to obtain mercy. But when we have that separation, we have that great gulf. You know, and I like to say it's like this, you know, up here we have the platform, and then we have the rows of chairs down there. Now, if those chairs were raised up to the same height as this, there would still be that gulf that's between us. That's what sin does to man. Sin creates this gulf down here with God on one side and man on the other side. But thank God for Jesus. Thank God for sending his son. Because it's the cross that allows us to go from God on one side and man on the other to be able to have access. God would man and man would God. But it's all because of the cross. Without the cross, we still have this great gulf. Without the cross, we still have a separation from the Father. But it's because of the Father's love, because he loved me so much that he was willing to send his son to die on a cross. Not because of anything that the son did, but it's because of what I did. And can you just imagine Jesus, the Word made flesh, God incarnate, who had been with the Godhead from the beginning of time. And he comes down and, and he puts on this flesh, has to take a bath, has to go to the bathroom, has to eat. He did this for me. He did this for you. He did this for all mankind. Because he wants to reconcile man back to the place he intended. He doesn't want his creation to be walking around dead. But he wants his creation to have life. And we as believers, when we place our faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that allows us to come alive. That allows that life force to begin to flow throughout our bodies. None of us were born Christians. There has not been one man on this earth that was born a Christian. But we've all been born as sinners. From death from birth, we came into this world dying because of the fall of man, because of the sin nature. But it's all about, although, let me put it this way, we all start in the same place as sinners. We all start with the fallen nature of Adam. But it's when we begin to place our faith, or I should say it better this way, where we place our faith. Because, you know, the world has faith. I got faith in my favorite football team. I got faith in my favorite entertainer. I got faith in my job. I got faith in my money. But we need to place our faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We need to place our faith where it's actually going to do us some good. Because heaven and earth is going to pass away. But it's the word that's going to remain. You know, all that we acquire in this world is for naught. Now, don't get me wrong. We need to work. We need to make money. We need to pay our bills. So don't nobody leave here going, oh, Sister Lincoln said it's all for naught. I ain't got to work no more. Well, 
Scripture says if a man don't work, he don't eat. So you might want to go out there and keep calling it. But it's all for naught. Because it doesn't matter what we do in this world other than where we place our faith that is actually going to count. We can spend a lifetime, I'm talking 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, which is just a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. But you know, when in this lifetime, somebody lives 60 years, it's like, ooh, they're 60. Let them go to 70. Ooh, they're 70. 80. Ho, ho. Now, when you're pushing 90 and 100, it's like, they have lived so long. But compare 100 years to all eternity. It's nothing. So this life that we have is just a fleeting moment and what's in store for us. And I can remember it's been, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. My brother said it so well. He said, everybody has eternal life. We don't think about it that way. But it's just a matter of where you spend that eternal life. Do you spend it in hell and torment? Or do you spend it with Jesus? Praising and magnifying him throughout all eternity. We don't have to be dead in this world and live a dead life. But we can be dead yet alive. But the life only comes through Jesus Christ. As I mentioned earlier, sin separates us from God. Sin is the death of the soul. When I read that, I thought, ooh, that's interesting. We never think about our soul dying. Yet, every day, we eat food, we drink water to nourish our body. We may even go to the gym, work out, walk, Zumba, aerobics, ride a bike, do something to exercise our body, to build up this natural man. But we leave our soul lacking. We continue day to day living in a sinful state. And you know, it's easy to say, well, I'm not committing sin. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't commit adultery, no fornication. But it's those little things in your heart, the malice, the hatred, the just not being a nice person. This separates us because this is not the life that God intended for us to have. He intended for us not just to have this life so that we can hoard it and keep it to ourselves, but to have this life so we can give this life to somebody else. You know, it's sort of like if you've ever taken a first aid class and they teach you how to do CPR, mouth to mouth. They teach you what it is to give life to somebody whose life is leaving. When God blesses us to have life and we come out of that death reign, we need to be blessing somebody else's life. We need to be looking out there and seeing somebody who's dead and saying, ooh, let me provide first aid to them. Let me tell them that that first aid, that mouth to mouth, that CPR is Jesus Christ. He's the one that can provide the life. But we have to be that conduit to let somebody know it's not about all of what about I can do, but it's all about what God and his son has already done. See, there's no way that we can work upon this life that I'm talking about. There's no way that we can earn this life that I'm talking about. But it was God by himself in the form of the Son who came down and was obedient unto the Father and gave his life 
so that he could complete the Father's plan of salvation for us. Verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. It's all about the mercy of God. You know, it's one thing about God. God is a constant. He's not up today and down tomorrow. And so his love and his mercy has been constant throughout all of time. He looked down. He said, my creation needs some help. And if I don't step in to help, they're going to spend eternity in the fallen state that they're in. You know, we can go back and, and look at in Genesis, after Adam and Eve had fallen, as God was talking, he said that we need to put them out of the garden lest they take hold of the tree of life. If they had taken hold of the tree of life, man would have been in this fallen state throughout eternity. Unless God came in, wiped us all out, and started all over again. He can do that. <laughs> so don't get me wrong. But it was because of the plan that he knew. He knew from the foundation of the world that mankind was going to need a lamb. And he prepared that lamb. Without a spot, without a blemish, he prepared one lamb to give life to the whole world. One lamb. When you look back in the book of Genesis, I'm sorry, in Exodus, where the Passover began, and God told them to go out and, and take a little lamb, kill it, put the blood on the doorpost, cook it, eat it. It was a lamb for the family. And then we go to the sacrifices. And each person has to take a lamb, examine it, take it to the temple, sacrifice it. And then we look at Jesus, the Pascal lamb. He was examined, found without spot or blemish. And it wasn't just for myself or my family or for my nation, but it's for all of mankind. And it, it is God who, because of his mercy, because of his great love, because he loves us. And you know, even though the scripture said love because we're looking at what he accomplished, I like to say loves. As in, he loves me right now. He loved me back then. He loves me right now. And he continues to love me in the future. And it's all about God's love for man. There are three verbs in the Greek that talk about being made alive, raised, and seated. And this is what God is, has, and will do in man. He makes us alive. He raises us and seats us to be in heavenly places. And it's because of this great love that he has for us. If you think about it in the, in the natural, you know, and sometimes it's, it's kind of hard to compare what we would do to what we think we would do to what we would actually do to what God does. And you know, 
we all like to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Because none of us like to see ourselves in a bad position. We always want to see ourselves as when the disciples told Jesus, shall we rain down fire? Shall we call down fire on these people that are not willing to receive you? We look at that and we think, oh, I would never do that. And then we think, that was really bad of them. That wasn't showing the love of God. And then we think, if I had the opportunity, I would do something different. But the reality of it is, it's in our heart. And just take a moment. Think about a situation that you were in. Somebody did you wrong. What was your initial reaction? Not saying what you did, but what was your initial reaction? Thank God for Jesus. Because we all have that initial reaction. Then we go, Lord, help me please, Jesus. You know, and we're trying to keep it down. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, Lord, yes, help, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord, because I really want to slap that person. But it's his mercy, his love, his grace. That, a call, that causes us to be alive. You know, and as I said, because we can think about what it is that we would do. It's not necessarily what we would do. And we have to remember, as I said earlier, all of mankind started out as sinners. The only difference with us as believers now we're saved sinners. You know, we're no better than anybody else. The better comes in Jesus. We're no better than the man in the gutter. We're no better than the crack addict. We're no better than the woman who sells her body on the street. We're no better than the one that steals. The only difference is we've accepted Jesus. Because if we had not accepted Jesus, if we did not accept the life that he gives us, we would be that crack addict. We would be that woman on the street. Maybe not selling, we might just be giving it away. So we can't think of ourselves more highly than we are. We can't think of ourselves that where we are in this life, what things have been accomplished in our life, we have done. Because the only reason why we've been able to accomplish them is because of the love of God. And when we look at not just our life, but all of mankind, you know, the scripture says he reigns on the just, just like the unjust. So we can't use, well, God only blesses his kids. As I said earlier, God is a constant. His blessings just flow. And if you happen to be in the area where his blessing is flowing at that time, guess what? You get blessed. It's not because I've run over here and I've done this and so God's blessings are going to come upon me. No, his blessings just flow. There are some things that we have to do in order to be in obedience to God's word, but that does not make us any better than anybody else. That does not put us in a better standing than anybody else that just allows his blessings to come upon us and overtake us. It allows those windows of heaven to be opened up upon us. Verse 5 says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And Paul just continues to tell the Ephesians, you were dead in sin. You are a sinner. Let me backtrack, because I don't like when I hear you, because you seems like you are a sinner. You did not do right. You were wrong. No, we all are. <laughs> this is not about 
you did this and I did that. No. It's about we are all sinners. And this is what he was bringing out to the church because we were all sinners. Death is the wages that we deserved for being sinners. But God, but God, even in our sinful state, even when we were yet dead in trespasses and sin, he hath quickened us. He has made us alive. And when you think about that life that he's given us, he has given us hope. Hope in knowing that this is not as good as it gets. Doesn't matter how good it is right now. This is not as good as it gets. You know, the last couple of days, oh, okay, the last week or so, I've been suffering with some ailments in my body. And last night, it was really rough. It seemed like everywhere I moved, I was in pain. And I was like, oh, oh. And I can remember waking up in the middle of the night, and all I heard was, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. And it, it just seemed like every joint in my body hurt. I had mentioned to pastor, I said, honey, do you know what it feels like when you can feel every strand of hair on your head and it hurts? Thank God, this is not as good as it gets. One day, I'm not going to wor worry about feeling the aches and the pains in this mortal body. And you know, even though Jesus took 39 stripes on his back, and I know that I'm healed with the ailments that come upon me, that doesn't stop the ailments from coming upon me. That doesn't stop the pain in my body. But one day I'm going to be able to live in a pain-free body. One day this mortal is going to put on immortality, and I'm going to be like Jesus. But it's because of the life that he gives us as believers. It's because he has quickened us to move from death into life. And he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. As I said earlier, this is not as good as it gets. Doesn't matter how good this is, there's a better place for me. Doesn't matter what I have in this lifetime, there's for, more for me to get with Jesus. It's more for me with the life that he has given me. I cannot imagine not spending eternity with Jesus. It seems like the more I think about it, the more I yearn for it. God has blessed us with a good life. But it's not a life to where we should get, what's the word I'm looking for? Satisfied. We're pilgrims. We're just passing through. Doesn't matter what we have. It's all going to pass away. You know, it's like somebody said, when Jesus comes and he calls me to be going up yonder, whatever I have, it's yours. Breaks for you. Because if you get to have it, you ain't gone. If you don't go, you miss out on the life that God has for a dead and dying generation. The Father has so much more, so much more for us. And the scripture tells us if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our heavenly Father give to us when we cry day and night, Lord, I need your help. You know, it's not about 
gimme, lemme, can you spare, take me here, take me there, God, give me more of this. But it's, God, I want to be closer to you. God, I want to understand your word just a little bit better. Father, take me deeper. Help me to have a more intimate relationship with you. When we cry out, he hears those cries. He gives us the desires of our heart. I'm asking the musicians to come back. And as they do, I want to close with this. Our only ticket out from death is the way that God planned it. Salvation by God's merciful divine grace through faith alone in the full merits of Christ. Somewhere in the beginning, and as far as we know, it came from the fall of man in garden. In the garden, I'm sorry. Sin entered the world. And when sin entered the world, death came with it. And this morning, we have a choice. We can continue walking around dead and be dead. Or we can make the decision to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Accept the sacrifice that has been paid. Accept the love that God has shown to mankind. Accept the gift that he has given us and accept his life. We don't want to be dead men walking around dead. But we can be dead men walking around alive. We can be because we have placed our faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The sacrifice that was paid. This is what allows us to come alive in him. Let's stand to our feet. Holy and righteous Father, Lord, we just thank you for your plan of salvation. We thank you, Lord, because the price has already been paid. The life has already been given. There's nothing, Lord, that we can do. There's no way we can merit it. We can't work upon it. But you have given this dead man a chance to have life and that life eternal spent with you. Lord, we look to you this morning asking that you continue to keep your hand upon us. Let your spirit, Lord, continue to direct us in the way that you would have us to go. Help us, Lord, so that we can take first aid out to a dead and dying world and we can provide that world with the life that you have given us and God we give you all the praise and all the glory in your holy name amen 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 praise you Lord Jesus hallelujah what a good gospel we have amen glory to God praise his name thank you Jesus hallelujah so good to hear the gospel. It's as simple as can be, but it saves for all of eternity. Hallelujah. We serve a good God. So glad you joined us this morning. Those that are joining us by webcast, we invite you. You can also join us for the 11 o'clock service. Uh, reminder, those in-house, that's, that's the website. You can pull it up on your phone. And uh, that way you'll have access to your giving profile and all that. Or I'll meet you in the lobby. We can do it on the kiosk if you, if you need help and you didn't bring your phone this morning. With that, God bless you. We love you and you are dismissed. This morning's message is a message of hope. Saved by grace. Not by anything we've done, not by anything that we've earned. But by simply coming to our Heavenly Father 
and asking forgiveness of our sins. We want to thank you so much for joining us today, and we want to welcome you back to our 11 o'clock service. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Thank <laughs> you.